June 1, 1981. The Chicago sky is dark and gloomy. Rain pounds against the concrete as three detectives approach a field behind the Rip Van Winkle Motel in Vila Park, responding to a call claiming a body has been found nearby. Nestled among dive bars and rundown shops, the motel is notorious for attracting dubious characters, known by various names like the Bear Rabbit Hotel and the Moonlit Hotel. It has a reputation as a rendezvous for quick encounters involving drugs, sex, and other illicit activities. The three detectives, their coats dripping with rainwater, approach the seedy motel having already made up their minds about what they're about to see. Another tragedy. Another normal day on the job, but what they were soon about to discover was anything but normal. And they could never have known just how deep and depraved a rabbit hole they were about to be sent down. The Ripper crew, the most disturbing cult killers in American history, earlier that day a maid working in the motel had noticed a progressively worsening odor outside, prompting her manager to go and investigate it. Expecting to find a dead rat or something similar, the manager moved into the litter-strewn field behind the establishment, searching for the source. To his horror, he stumbled across the heavily decomposed remains of a young woman, her body almost entirely skeletal with only small fragments of flesh still clinging to her bones. When the three detectives arrived to see the same sight, they instantly recognized that the advanced state of decomposition meant that the body had been dead for a considerable length of time. Had she really been lying here unnoticed the entire time? Although there was a myriad of unanswered questions, one thing was perfectly clear. This woman had been murdered. Despite the advanced decomposition, with wildlife and maggots having taken their toll, the skeletal frame still bore handcuffs on the now exposed wrists, affirming the grim nature of her demise. A cloth gag remained lodged in her mouth, and though she wore a sweater, her underwear was pulled down. Surprisingly, a small wad of dollar bills remained in her socks, eliminating robbery as a motive and hinting at the much darker and more disturbing fate that had befallen her. The three detectives were now tasked with trying to ascertain the identity of the deceased woman and establish a time frame between her death and her discovery. A daunting task, given the condition of the body, especially back in the 80s, without access to many of the institutions and technologies we have today. The detectives and their teams also needed to determine whether the site where the woman's remains were found was the primary crime scene, or a secondary location where she had been disposed of after death. The absence of any previous reports of the body prior to the maid noticing the smell that day suggested that it might not have actually been there for an extended period of time. But if that was the case, then the perpetrator would have to have transported a rotten, decomposed body before dumping it behind the hotel. An unsettling idea for them to accept that even the most depraved killer could carry out. These doubts about the duration of time her body had been there prompted soil sample analysis to ascertain if bodily fluids had permeated the ground yet to try and help them determine the time frame of abandonment. But before they could do that, they had to remove the decomposing corpse and deliver it to Deputy Coroner Pete Siegmann so he could attempt to establish a cause and manner of death. But after encountering difficulties obtaining fingerprints due to the horrific state of the body, hopes of identifying the unknown woman seemed slim. As they waited for their results, the detectives searched through missing person reports, but struggled to make any meaningful connections to the victim. After contacting the Chicago department, they were informed that the practice of concealing money in socks likely indicated the victim was a sex worker, making the chances of identifying her even less likely. But to their surprise, the coroner's hard work paid off, and he was able to obtain dental impressions from the victim that led to a match in less than two weeks, identifying her as Linda Sutton, 21. As they'd suspected, Linda was a prostitute with a history of arrests. Tragically, she was also the mother of two children, both of whom were living with her mother at the time. But then came the shocking and gruesome twist nobody saw coming. Despite the advanced decomposition of her body, the coroner determined Linda had only been dead for three days. But how the hell could that be possible, given the skeletal state of her remains? The coroner told the detectives that the accelerated decay resulted from significant chest wounds, where the victim's breasts had been completely removed providing a gateway for parasites that rapidly consumed the body. 
he found that Linda had been brutally abused and assaulted with the removal of her left breast having occurred while she was still alive. She had likely been held and tortured over the duration of a week, suffering stabbings, mutilation and assault, and the detectives were soon going to realize that she was just the first of many victims of a horrific cult that the media would soon dub the Ripper Crew. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This story is only just beginning, a spree of brutality. Months passed with no leads or developments on the disturbing case, and it soon grew cold. But then, on February 12th, 1982, the car of a 35-year-old cocktail waitress was discovered on the roadside. Though her tank was empty, her purse could still be seen on the front seat and her keys remained in the ignition. Yet there was no sign of her. Would she really have just left her belongings there like that and walked off? Unnerved as the police searched nearby for the missing woman, they came across another horrific sight. Her body lay strewn on a nearby embankment. She had been assaulted, tortured, and mutilated, with her breast being amputated. Within mere days of her body being found, another grim discovery unfolded as the body of a Hispanic woman wearing an engagement ring was uncovered. She too had been a victim of violent assault and strangulation, and severe bite marks could be found on her breasts. Her twisted murderer had even masturbated over her lifeless body. However, neither of these cases were linked to the cold case of Linda Sutton. At least, not quite yet. Instead, they were suspected to be the result of different killers. The latter being profiled as a local man with a dark psychopathic side he hid behind familial normalcy. A couple of months later, as these cases had also turned cold, on the morning of May 15th, Lorraine Borowski, known as Lori, was seen leaving her residence at Elmhurst Gardens at around 8 a.m., headed towards the Remax office on St. Charles Road where she was employed. But when her boss, Donald Stibb, arrived at the office at 8.30, he found that the door was still locked. As he entered, he noticed scattered items on the sidewalk in front of the building, women's shoes, a keychain with keys, and cosmetics. Assuming a woman had dropped her belongings, he gathered them and brought them inside, subsequently alerting the police. But as he awaited the arrival of law enforcement, Donald noticed something on the keychain. It bore a key with his own company's name. Recounting the incident to Detective Raymond Bradford, he stated, I saw all the stuff on the ground and I didn't think anything of it. Then, I saw the Remax keychain. I tried the key and it fit our lock. Believing the recovered items belonged to Lori, Donald and the detective ventured outside to scour the vicinity for her. The detective contacted her neighbors, gathering information on what she was wearing that fateful morning. Khaki slacks paired with a white ruffled blouse, and she carried a beige purse with wooden handles. Lori's boss added details about her typical jewelry, mentioning four gold rings and an ankle chain. A be on the lookout alert was issued for Lori as she was deemed to be in imminent danger. All the evidence seemed to indicate she had been taken from outside her workplace, possibly as she prepared to unlock the door. Lori's whereabouts would remain elusive for four months until the discovery of her body on October 10th, 1982, by hunters navigating the Clarendon Hills Cemetery near Westmont. Dumped amidst the thicket, her clothing scattered nearby, the grim find was in a place her family had searched shortly before the hunters stumbled upon her. Because of this, the assumption arose that her captors not only prolonged her life post-abduction, but retained her lifeless form for a period before disposing of it in the cemetery. Post-mortem examination exposed the harrowing details of Lori's ordeal. She had endured repeated acts of sexual violence, with a wire tightly encircling one breast until it severed. Savage beatings marred her body, and an unsettling discovery indicated the insertion of an object into the wound left by her severed breast. Lori ultimately met her demise at the hands of a hatchet, a mere two weeks after the abduction and attack on Lori, another woman was targeted. Shui Mak, a recent immigrant to the United States, had spent just three years in the country since relocating from Hong Kong to contribute to her family's restaurant, Ling Ling's in Streamwood. On the evening of May 29, 1982, after concluding her work shift, Shui departed the family's restaurant in the company of her brother, Kent. A disagreement ensued during their car journey regarding Kent's decision to appropriate a table from the restaurant for use in painting the garage at home. While on the highway, Kent pulled over and instructed Shui to exit the vehicle, urging her to catch a ride home with their parents, who were en route. Kent continued his journey, leaving Shui stranded at the intersection of Barrington and Irving Park Roads in Hanover Park. Ling, their sister, was driving the other car that night and passed Shui along the roadside. It wasn't until both vehicles reached home that they realized Shui still awaited pickup. Immediately they set out to retrieve her. 
but their search proved futile as Shui was now nowhere to be found. Concerned by their inability to locate Shui, the family promptly contacted the police. Their anxiety stemmed from Shui's lack of funds, absence of identification, and her lack of proficiency in English. Despite law enforcement efforts to scour the area, the girl remained untraceable. A be on the lookout alert was issued for Shui, describing her last known attire, a red sweater, black pants, and sandals. Towards the end of September 1982, authorities received a distressing call reporting the discovery of a woman's lifeless body in a field east of Barrington Road in the town of South Barrington. The location was a mere mile from where Shui had disembarked from her brother's car that pivotal night. Shui's remains were found clad in the same red sweater and black slacks she had worn on that fateful evening. The subsequent autopsy unveiled a fatal skull fracture as the cause of her demise. And once again, her body echoed the pattern of mutilation seen in the previous victims. Ling, Shui's sister, could only identify her by the distinctive clothing she wore. The police found themselves grappling with a string of eerily similar killings, all involving young women who had suffered the gruesome loss of a breast. Despite the clear pattern, leads remained frustratingly elusive in all of these likely connected cases, that is, until the emergence of another victim, Angel York, who managed to survive her ordeal. On June 13th, Angel willingly entered a van with an individual she presumed to be a John, given her occupation as a prostitute. However, the John turned out to be more than one assailant. Once inside the van, her attackers restrained her by handcuffing her to the vehicle's interior. Shockingly, one of the men handed her a knife and instructed her to mutilate her own breast. Angel recounted that after complying, one of the assailants descended into a violent frenzy. He reclaimed the knife, inflicting further harm to her breast, and then committed a disturbing act by ejaculating into the wound. Upon concluding the assault, he sealed the wound with duct tape before callously abandoning Angel on the street. Distraught and horrifically wounded, Angel managed to promptly contact the police to report the harrowing incident. Although she provided descriptions of her attackers, law enforcement faced challenges in locating them. Unfortunately, Angel had limited information about the van and lacked details about the assailants' names. While the detectives unfortunately had little to go off of, they did finally have the knowledge that some sort of group was potentially behind this string of horrific murders. Regrettably, law enforcement was unable to prevent the subsequent murder of another vulnerable young prostitute, Sandra Delaware, in August. Dumped along the Chicago River, Delaware exhibited signs of the same modus operandi, wrists bound, breast removed, and a ligature around her throat. The subsequent autopsy revealed that her body had been found a mere six hours after her demise. Less than a month later, on September 8, 1982, the lifeless body of Rose Beck Davis, a 30-year-old marketing executive from Broadview, was discovered in an alley. She had been callously discarded under a stairwell belonging to a three-story North Lake Shore apartment building in the Gold Coast neighborhood. Positioned on her back, Rose's nearby discarded sweater seemed forcibly torn from her body. Her blue corduroy slacks were also found in close proximity, drawing immediate attention from investigators who noted unsettling similarities to the wounds inflicted on previous victims. A subsequent autopsy unveiled the horrifying extent of Rose's ordeal. She had been repeatedly stabbed, assaulted, and strangled with a black sock. Her visage bore the brutal marks of a severe beating, rendering her nearly unrecognizable. Numerous small cuts and punctures marred her stomach, while her breast suffered the same fate as the preceding victims. Ultimately, Rose met her demise through numerous hatchet blows to the face and head. Then, on October 6, 1982, everything changed for the case. Beverly Washington was discovered near the railroad tracks in Chicago's Humboldt Park. Unlike the other victims of the Ripper crew, Beverly miraculously clung to life, having been mistakenly presumed dead by her assailants who callously dumped her body. Fortuitously, Beverly was stumbled upon by a passerby who promptly called for assistance. She was found with multiple injuries, including the amputation of her left breast, a severely slashed right breast, and numerous stab wounds inflicted upon her body. This particular attack would prove to be the undoing of the Ripper crew. Beverly recounted her harrowing experience to the police, describing an encounter with a red Dodge van with tinted windows. The driver had approached her, inquiring about the cost for a date. Despite offering more than she had requested, she grew uneasy, but decided to enter the van anyway. In her detailed statement to the authorities, she mentioned distinctive features such as feathers hanging from the rearview mirror attached to a roach clip. The driver, a slender white man around 25 years old, wore a flannel shirt and square-toed boots during the attack. 
Beverly described him having greasy brown hair and a mustache. Once inside the van, the man brandished a gun, instructing Beverly to move to the rear of the vehicle, separated by a plywood divider. Accessible through a hinged plywood door, the back of the van featured wooden shelves housing tools and electrical wiring. Under the man's orders, Beverly undressed, complying as he handcuffed her and coerced her into performing oral sex. She recounted how the interior of the van was lined with carpet on both the floor and ceiling. Beverly continued her chilling narrative, stating, Then he assaulted me and shoved some pills into my mouth and made me wash them down with soda pop. As she began to lose consciousness, she saw the man holding a cord, fearing he intended to kill her. I blacked out, and the next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. Mere hours after the discovery of Beverly's body, the Ripper crew approached a phone booth in their van. Opening fire, they targeted Rafael Torado and an unidentified man accompanying him. Both individuals sustained gunshot wounds, but Rafael was the intended victim and the sole fatality. Identifying the Rippers, the specifics Beverly was able to offer about both the vehicle and her attackers played a pivotal role in a timely arrest. Detective Warren Wilkos took to Cicero Avenue, engaging with prostitutes and distributing flyers detailing the Ripper Crew's van particulars. Eventually, the Chicago police tracked down the van on North Central Avenue. The driver, a husky, red-haired man, didn't align with Beverly Washington's description. However, upon inspection, the interior matched Beverly's detailed account exactly. The driver turned out to be Edward Spritzer. Upon questioning, he revealed that the van belonged to his boss, Robin Gecht. When asked about his destination, Spritzer mentioned meeting his boss at an apartment under renovation. The officers followed the van to the location, and Spritzer informed his boss that some cops wished to speak with him. Upon encountering Robin Gecht, officers immediately noticed a striking resemblance to Beverly's description. Gecht even wore the same type of shirt and boots she had mentioned. However, the most unsettling aspect was Gecht's unnervingly calm demeanor. It was a moment of either mistaken identity or a chilling encounter with a true psychopath. The officers informed Gecht about the van's association with a potential crime and directed him to the Area 5 headquarters for questioning. Gecht complied, showing no fear or emotion. Simultaneously, technicians searched the van and discovered a pill. Subsequent lab analysis confirmed it was a sedative tablet, mirroring the victim's account of being forced to swallow a similar substance. With the identification of Robin Gecht, investigators initiated a comprehensive examination of him. Their findings revealed that two years preceding the onset of the murders, Gecht had faced arrest and charges related to contributing to the sexual delinquency of a 14-year-old girl. Significantly, during his arrest, Gecht resided in Hanover Park a location coinciding with the disappearance of Schwemach around the same period. As they delved deeper into Gecht's background, investigators unearthed a troubling incident from his teenage years. He had molested his own sister. Subsequently, his family sent him to live with his grandmother. During the initial encounter, Gecht had been cooperative and willing to converse with the police. During this phase, their inquiries were primarily focused on his van. Initially tight-lipped, Spritzer and Gecht provided limited information. However, Cracks began to appear, particularly in Spritzer, who displayed signs of breaking down under the weight of genuine fear instilled by Gecht. The shocking confessions, intensifying their efforts, authorities succeeded in compelling Spritzer to disclose the gruesome details, burdened by guilt for his actions. This process resulted in a comprehensive 78-page statement from Spritzer. His revelations commenced with an admission of driving the van while Gecht committed a fatal drive-by shooting, leaving one man dead and another paralyzed. Investigators swiftly corroborated this incident. Following this, Gecht directed Spritzer to slow down to pick up a black prostitute. Gecht engaged in sexual acts with her before taking her into an alley where he used a knife to sever her left breast, placing it on the van's floor. Spritzer, visibly disturbed, recounted his discomfort with the bloodshed during these horrific episodes. He further disclosed that, on occasion during their stalking activities, there were instances when Gecht, in a heightened state of excitement, would immediately engage in sexual acts with a severed breast. Instead of waiting until they returned to the apartment where their satanic ritual was supposed to take place. Additionally, Spritzer described Gecht's heinous act of shooting a black woman in the head, chaining her, and weighting her down in water using bowling balls, leading him to believe she was never found. He also recounted an instance when Gecht bludgeoned a woman to death with a hammer, causing Spritzer to involuntarily vomit at the gruesome sight. Spritzer admitted that it took him some time before he could personally amputate a breast. 
Under the coercion of his leader, Gecht, he confessed uncertainty about the woman's status when he removed both her breasts, and he made no attempt to ascertain if she was dead or alive. Following the removal, Gecht compelled him to engage in sexual acts with the open wounds. In his testimony to investigators, Spritzer depicted Robin Gecht as being consumed by an insatiable bloodlust during the murders. He described an incident where Gecht ruthlessly hacked off a woman's breast in an alley while she was still alive. Subsequently, after severing the breast, Gecht engaged in sexual acts with the gruesome wound. Despite the woman's screams and the gushing blood, Gecht remained unfazed. After completing the assault, he took an axe and mercilessly beat the woman to death. The culmination of Spritzer's revelations left investigators stunned, detailing seven outright murders and one aggravated battery. During interviews with Gecht's wife, she reluctantly disclosed that Gecht had subjected her to extreme actions, including the actual slicing of her breasts. Despite this being against her will, she had never reported her husband to the authorities. Detectives expanded their inquiries to individuals acquainted with Gecht from the neighborhood. It became evident that not only his criminal associates, but also a majority of those who crossed paths with him harbored a profound fear of him. Some individuals shared with the police that Gecht seemed to possess an inexplicable influence over them, capable of drawing them in and compelling them to carry out his wishes. One apprehensive individual cautioned the officer never to meet Gecht's gaze, asserting that it had the power to ensnare. They recounted heinous acts Gecht had coerced them into, actions they detested but found themselves unable to refuse. While Spritzer was providing his confession, Robin Gecht remained seated in another interrogation room with his lawyer, maintaining the same calm and composed demeanor as on the initial day. Armed with the details from Spritzer's admission, investigators placed pictures of the seven victims on the table before Gecht. However, he steadfastly denied any knowledge of them. In an attempt to unsettle him, the police escorted Gecht down the hall to witness Spritzer confessing. Witnesses reported that Gecht displayed no visible signs of being perturbed, continuing to claim his innocence. However, within the room where Spritzer was located, the atmosphere underwent a drastic shift. The moment Spritzer laid eyes on Gecht, he turned pale and abruptly altered his narrative. Spritzer hastily retracted his confession, asserting that Gecht had never committed any murders. His account grew chaotic, leaving interrogators bewildered. Spritzer shifted blame to another man, his girlfriend's brother, Andrew Kokorales, although he provided scant details about him. Gecht acknowledged knowing Kokorales and furnished the police with an address, but his demeanor remained undisturbed. Curiously, he claimed to be completely unaware of Kokorales's crimes, in contrast to Spritzer's accounts. Perplexed, the police turned to question the third member of the alleged killing crew harboring doubts about the plausibility of three men engaging in such horrific acts together. Little did they know, the unfolding revelations were only scratching the surface. Regrettably, the evidence against Robin Gecht was insufficient to detain him, necessitating his release. In an effort to gather more information, investigators presented a photo array, including Gecht's picture, to Beverly Washington in the hospital. Despite weeks of recovery from her injuries, she identified Gecht as the assailant. With Gecht now maintaining silence, detectives opted to speak with individuals in his life who were not believed to be involved in the crimes. It was revealed that in his younger years, Gecht had asked girls he was dating to allow him to stab them with pins in the breast during intimate encounters. Convinced they had the correct individuals, investigators persisted in delving into the Ripper crew's histories during the period of the murders, aiming to establish links to the crimes. In 1981, Gecht had leased a room at the Rip Van Winkle Motel for an extended period. Edward Spritzer and Andrew Kokorales, alongside his brother Thomas, had also rented three adjoining rooms. The investigators uncovered this information when the Kokorales brothers redirected their mail from this address upon relocating, leaving a trace with the U.S. Postal Service. Upon interviewing the motel manager, he vividly recalled the men, having taken note of their boisterous gatherings, describing them as some kind of cultists. The men were known to frequently bring numerous women back to their rooms. Detectives swiftly succeeded in breaking Andrew Kokorales during the interrogation. He began disclosing chilling details about the kidnapped and murdered women with an unsettling precision that matched the coroner's reports. Kokorales delved into the harrowing specifics of how they abducted women for the purpose of assault and torture, revealing their routine use of knives and other implements like razors, tin can lids, and can openers to mutilate their victims. 
He provided further elaboration on the use of piano wire to amputate the breasts of different women, confirming the crew's disturbing practice of taking turns masturbating into the severed breasts before consuming parts of them during what he claimed were satanic rituals. In a shocking admission, Andrew Kokorileis confessed to being involved in 18 murders, which included victims Lorraine Borowski and Rose Beck Davis. He also recounted the assault and murder of victim Sandra Delaware, offering explicit details. Kokorileis described how they silenced her screams by placing a rock in her mouth during the attack. After forcing themselves upon her, they proceeded to stab her body with a knife and mutilate her before strangling her to death. His grim account was completely corroborated by the autopsy report. Initially, when investigators engaged in conversation with his younger, slow-witted brother, Thomas Kokorileis, his statements were riddled with inconsistencies, and he struggled to maintain a coherent narrative. Subsequently, a polygraph test administered at the police station yielded negative results, indicating deception. Armed with the additional confessions from his accomplices and Thomas Kokorileis's failed polygraph, securing his confession proved relatively uncomplicated. Thomas disclosed to detectives that he, along with the other men, would bring women to Gecht's residence, which harbored a satanic chapel in the attic. In this sinister space, they subjected women to acts of assault and torture, frequently employing knives and ice picks for mutilation. He detailed the use of a wire garrote for the removal of women's breasts. Following the gruesome act of breast removal, they would engage in a disturbing ritual. Each participant would masturbate into the severed breast, and then, as a sacrament, consume a portion of it. Thomas described this macabre act of consuming flesh as taking communion. Gecht, the leader, would preserve the removed breasts in a box, with Thomas recalling a count of 15 inside. During his recorded confession, Thomas admitted to being present during three murders, including that of Lorraine Borowski. Elmhurst police detective John Miller, who sat through Thomas's confession, expressed his shock, stating, I've handled numerous homicide cases, and I had never encountered anything so horrendous in my life. It's noteworthy that neither Edward Spritzer nor Andrew Kokorales implicated Thomas in their respective confessions, satanic rituals and killer clowns. Regular gatherings took place at Gecht's residence, timed conveniently after his wife's late-night departure for work and his children's bedtime. Within his attic, a satanic chapel had been fashioned, complete with a red-clothed altar and eerie ambiance illuminated solely by the flickering candles. The walls adorned with six red and black crosses set the stage for their sinister activities. Tragically, the majority of the Ripper crew's victims met their gruesome fate in this very attic. The women endured torture at the hands of the men, who wielded knives and employed piano wire to cruelly amputate their breasts. Throughout these horrific acts, Gecht recited passages from the Satanic Bible. Notably, the perpetrators conducted the breast amputations while the victims were still alive. As part of their ritualistic sacrament, they consumed the severed breasts in the attic, even if the killings occurred elsewhere. Gecht continued to read passages while each man took turns engaging in disturbing acts. Afterward, Gecht would cut the flesh into pieces, and they would all partake in consuming it. Within the Ripper crew, there existed a belief that their leader, Gecht, possessed supernatural powers. According to them, he harnessed these abilities to exert mental and physical control over his followers. Just as they had been drawn to him, the crew believed Gecht used his powers to ensnare others. They recounted feeling entranced, powerless to escape him and his supernatural influence. This perceived power facilitated Gecht's ability to manipulate them into committing acts of murder and cannibalism in accordance with his will. Upon apprehension by the police, the crew resorted to a common excuse often cited by followers of criminal leaders. They feared dire consequences, even death, if they defied their leader's commands. Thomas Kokorileis conveyed the sense of submission to Gecht's will, stating, You just have to do it, highlighting the unquestioning obedience prevalent among the followers. While Gecht may have displayed a more overtly sadistic nature than some leaders, his method of attracting followers mirrored that of others. He targeted men seeking a sense of belonging to something greater than themselves, a desire to feel significant. This shared yearning for significance extends beyond Gecht's crew and finds parallels with groups such as Manson's family, individuals who turned a blind eye to sexual abuse at Penn State University, and devout followers of the Catholic Church. In each case, a willingness to forgive even the most reprehensible acts stemmed from a desire to belong to a larger entity. Similar to Manson's followers, Gecht's crew maintained silence in court, refusing to testify against him. 
Even in captivity, he wielded a compelling allure, exercising a formidable degree of power and persuasion over his followers. The Ripper crew is a rare case of a serial killing group, and it becomes even more extraordinary when you discover that its leader, Gecht, was once employed by another notorious serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. In the late 1970s, Gacy owned the company PDM Contractors, and Gecht was one of its employees. Gacy, infamous for murdering young men, burying them beneath his house and adopting a clown persona, hinted at having an accomplice during his trial. Although he never disclosed the partner's identity, suspicions arose. Initially, a deceased young man who had worked for Gacy was attributed to the notorious serial killer. However, police later determined that Gacy was out of town at the time of the murder. Gacy claimed his accomplice committed the act without his consent. The question thus arises, could Robin Gecht have been the elusive partner he alluded to? Though many suspect it to be the case, the truth remains uncertain, as Gecht staunchly denies any wrongdoing. And John Wayne Gacy was executed in 1994, likely taking the secret to his grave with him. Following the arrest of the crew, the police executed search warrants at their residences. In Gecht's attic, they uncovered the Satanic Chapel, along with a rifle matching the one used in the shooting of Rafael Torado. Following interrogations, the team of killers faced a $1 million bond at Pontiac Correctional Center on various charges. Gecht vehemently denied the allegations despite his previous association with John Wayne Gacy. Gacy's actions were actually mocked and dismissed by Gecht, who said that Gacy's mistake was keeping bodies under the house, not the killings themselves. As investigations continued, more people revealed their fear of Gecht and belief in his manipulative powers. Witnesses attested to his ability to draw people toward him and bend them to his will. The media seized upon the story, crafting headlines that associated the Ripper crew or Chicago Rippers with the infamous Jack the Ripper. The Trials of Robin Gecht In an attempt to avoid trial, Gecht put forward an insanity plea. Despite being evaluated and found competent to stand trial, as well as deemed sane at the time of the offenses, he faced a mistrial, leading to the commencement of his second trial on September 20, 1983. The prosecution presented compelling evidence, including the discovery of the chapel and the rifle used in the shooting found during their search of his property, satanic literature and a trophy box owned by Gecht, containing as many as 15 pieces of female breast, were also found. The jury was provided with detailed accounts of the modus operandi from victim reports. Women were kidnapped, held captive, tortured with implements like needles and ice picks, assaulted and subjected to having their breasts sliced off with a garroting wire for a satanic ritual. While many victims died, two survivors bore the memories of these harrowing ordeals. Gecht took the stand to defend himself, admitting to the attack on Beverly Washington but vehemently denying involvement in any killings, sexual assaults, or aggravated battery. He claimed innocence, asserting that during the period of most murders, he had no association with the other defendants. Despite eyewitness testimony and accounts from women claiming Gecht had requested them to self-mutilate, the confessions of his accomplices were deemed inadmissible. Lacking physical evidence linking him to murder, Gecht could not be prosecuted directly for the killings, and his accomplices refused to testify against him. Nevertheless, the jury found Gecht guilty on all charges, including attempted murder, rape, deviate sexual assault, aggravated battery, and armed violence. He received a 120-year prison sentence. The trials of Thomas Cocorales, initially, Thomas Cocorales attempted to have his confessions thrown out, but the motion was unsuccessful. The Dupage County jury convicted Cocorales of the rape and murder of Lorraine Borowski. After the judge dismissed the prosecution's death penalty sentence, he was sentenced to life in prison. During the trial, Cocorales opted not to testify but spoke during sentencing, vehemently denying any involvement in the charged crimes. In 1986, the state appeals court overturned the guilty verdict, citing legal errors in the original trial. Subsequently, Thomas Cocorales was granted a new trial. A year later, Cocorales entered a guilty plea to the murder of Lorraine Borowski and received a 70-year sentence. In 2017, Thomas Cocorales became eligible for parole, prompting authorities to attempt to have him committed as a sexually violent person, which would secure his continued incarceration. To enact this statute, they needed to establish that it was substantially probable that Cocorales would commit further acts of sexual violence. References were made to Cocorales admitting to additional heinous assaults and murders while in prison. In a taped interview from 1982, he detailed his involvement in the assault of Shui Mak. Over the years, 
He confessed to participating in other crimes committed by the Ripper crew during interviews with mental health professionals, prison officers, and the press. Psychiatrists evaluated Cocorales in 2017, concluding that he was not sexually violent. Thomas Cocorales was released from prison after serving only half of his sentence and is required to register as a sex offender as long as he resides in Illinois. There have been mass protests and public outcries near the apartment he was residing in after his release. Detective Warren Wilkosh commented on Cocorales' release, expressing a lack of strong opinions. However, he emphasized that Gecht's potential parole would be a whole different thing, asserting he made Manson look like a Boy Scout. The trials of Andrew Cocorales, Andrew Cocorales, faced trials in two different counties. In the first trial, he was accused of the murder of Rose Beck Davis. According to his confession, he had participated in her abduction, forced her into the van, and brutally beaten her to death with a hatchet. The jury deliberated for just three hours before finding him guilty, resulting in a life sentence during his second trial. Although he initially confessed during police interrogations, Cocorales recanted his confessions before trial, claiming that the police coerced his statements. On the stand, he vehemently denied ever assaulting or killing anyone, asserting that his confessions were forced by the police. Despite Prosecutor Brian Tellander presenting evidence from multiple interrogations conducted by different detectives and prosecutors, Cocorales insisted that they had all dictated his statements. He also alleged that a police officer had provided him with details of the crime scene facilitating his confession. However, Detective Warren Wilkos testified that Cocorales had identified Lorraine Borowski from a photo lineup on his own and confessed, saying, that's the girl Eddie Spritzer and I killed in the cemetery. The credibility of the conflicting accounts became the focal point. Cocorales appeared sullen and angry, and his narrative of eight officials treating him uniformly unethically seemed implausible. The jury, reportedly deliberating for only an hour, rendered a guilty verdict for the murder of Lorraine Borowski, rejecting the claim that eight individuals had coerced him to lie and condemned him to death. At the sentencing hearing, Cocorales reiterated his innocence, and his defense argued that the crime did not warrant the death penalty. Testimonies from a prison chaplain and counselor portrayed Cocorales as non-threatening and capable of rehabilitation. He also contended that he had received ineffective counsel and that, regarding the earlier trial for the murder of Rose Beck Davis, the offense did not justify capital punishment, but rather, life imprisonment. Despite these arguments, the court upheld the sentence in 1989, dismissing appeals. In an attempt to alter their strategy, his attorneys pursued a different course of action. They contended that Cocorileus, suffering from schizophrenia, was a killer who was unaware of his actions during the murders. The argument asserted that the trial lawyers should have invoked an insanity defense, a crucial omission on their part. Surprisingly, they had not sought a psychiatric evaluation for Cocorales, highlighting a significant oversight. The appeals attorneys further maintained that when the trial lawyers neglected to recognize the necessity for an evaluation, the trial judge should have mandated one for the court, which did not happen. It was noteworthy that a prison psychiatrist had diagnosed Cocorales with borderline personality disorder and declared him incompetent to stand trial. However, this psychiatric diagnosis did not render him incompetent or insane making it a feeble argument at best. They argued that Cocorales was vulnerable to a strong influence, implying diminished responsibility for his actions. When the district judge probed the trial attorneys on these matters, they asserted that no discernible pattern of abnormal behavior had led anyone acquainted with the defendant to suspect a psychiatric disorder. This assurance seemed to satisfy the judge, deeming the pending affidavit unpersuasive. Despite this, the appeals attorneys pointed to Cocorales' peculiar behavior as evidence of his aberrant condition. The court, after considering this argument, concluded that abnormal behavior did not necessarily indicate the level of mental impairment required for an insanity finding. In a comprehensive 41-page opinion, the court declared no reversible error and affirmed the sentence once again. However, this was not the conclusion of the narrative, as a movement gained momentum to challenge all death sentences in the state. Scheduled for execution on March 17, 1999, Andrew Cocorales faced a last-minute reprieve as efforts were made to persuade then-Illinois Governor George Ryan to intervene. Supreme Court Justice Moses Harrison ordered a stay of execution and called for a statewide moratorium on all executions in Illinois. The Chicago Tribune's investigative articles on legal system injustices, leading to the exoneration of 12 individuals from death row, had a profound impact on Governor Ryan. Some were cleared through DNA evidence, while others were exonerated due to revelations of legal system mishandling. The case of Anthony Porter, a black man with an IQ of 51, 
highlighted the flaws in the system. Porter had spent 16 years in prison for a double homicide and was awaiting execution on September 23, 1998. Exculpatory evidence surfaced, leading to a stay, and another man confessed to the crime. This case underscored the state of Illinois prosecuting and imprisoning an innocent man, prompting a reassessment of the death penalty system. Despite these developments, Governor Ryan initially hesitated to reform the system, especially in light of cases like Cocorales, seemingly deserving of the death penalty. The Illinois State Supreme Court overturned Harrison's stay with a 4-3 vote, and just hours before Cocorales was set to be executed, Governor Ryan issued a three-page statement emphasizing that the decision had been made by a jury following the law of the land. Ryan, noting the rejection of appeals over 16 years, saw no grounds to intervene further. Thus, no obstacles remained between Cocorales and his execution. On the morning preceding his execution, Cocorales, transported to a super-maximum security prison in Tams, Illinois, spent the day in prayer and fasting. He spoke to a few close friends on the phone bidding farewell and shared a moment of prayer and tears with his brother. Despite being strapped onto the gurney, Cocorales maintained hope for a last-minute pardon. Offering an apology to the Borowski family, he proclaimed the kingdom of heaven was at hand before receiving a lethal injection at 12.34 p.m. By January 2000, Governor Ryan added a 13th man to the list of those wrongly placed on death row, leading to a statewide moratorium on executions. Cocorales thus became the last man executed before the moratorium. Some critics speculated that Governor Ryan deliberately timed the moratorium to follow Cocorales' execution, given his prior doubts about the system. While anti-capital punishment advocates raised concerns, many believed justice had been served. However, the impact of Ryan's decision had contrasting effects on the Spritzer case. The trials of Edward Spritzer Spritzer entered a guilty plea on April 2, 1984 for the murders of Rose Davis, Sandra Delaware, Shui Mack, and drug dealer Rafael Torado. He received life sentences for each murder, along with additional time for various charges, ranging from rape to deviant sexual assault. However, he still faced trial for the Linda Sutton murder. In a bench trial before Judge Edward Kowal on February 25, 1986, Spritzer admitted to abducting Sutton near Wrigley Field subjecting her to sexual assault, mutilating her and ultimately causing her death. Public defender Carol Anfinson, representing Spritzer, portrayed her client as an immature, impulsive individual merely following orders. Anfinson attempted to shift blame onto leader Robin Gecht, emphasizing Spritzer's alleged fear for his own life. Witnesses called to the stand by friends testified to Spritzer's generally easygoing demeanor and past experiences of bullying. However, another friend contradicted these assertions recounting Spritzer's boasts about his actions against the victims, including mutilations and self-inflicted killings. Despite Anfinson's plea for mercy, Spritzer was convicted on March 4th of aggravated kidnapping and murder. On March 20th, a jury deliberated for an hour before sentencing him to death for the Sutton murder. Consequently, he found himself on death row in the Pontiac State Correctional Facility in Joliet, Illinois. Despite claims by his attorney Gary Pritchard that Spritzer had been denied due process and had suffered brain damage, all appeals were exhausted. Pritchard argued that the jury had not been adequately instructed, but it seemed the case had reached its conclusion. However, in an unexpected turn of events, in October 2002, as part of the review of death row cases due to the moratorium on capital punishment, Spritzer, then 41, had his case reconsidered among 140 others. Pritchard sought mercy based on Spritzer's low IQ and troubled history, emphasizing his susceptibility to manipulation by individuals like Robin Gecht. Despite this, victims' families opposed a change in Spritzer's sentence, considering him the personification of evil. Prosecutor Michael Wolfe concurred, labeling his crimes as the worst of the worst. Although clemency was not granted during this review, Governor Ryan, as he left office in January 2003, issued pardons for four of the 164 death row inmates and granted blanket clemency to the remainder, including Edward Spritzer. While families expressed outrage and vowed to fight for justice, Spritzer had finally secured an unexpected reprieve. As a result, Spritzer's sentence was commuted to life in prison. The Aftermath of Evil On November 16, 1988, a tragic incident befell Robin Gecht's family. His mother Loretta, sister Rochelle, and nephew Nicholas who had visited him in prison, were involved in a car accident on their way home. The collision occurred between two semi-trucks, resulting in the instant deaths of Loretta and Nicholas. 
while Rachel lingered in a coma for four months before eventually succumbing. In March of 1999, Robin Gecht's son David faced legal troubles when he was arrested for first-degree murder. At 18 years old, David shot and killed Roberto Cruz in Northwest Chicago. Tried as an adult, he received a 45-year prison sentence. Throughout the years, Robin Gecht has participated in numerous interviews, consistently maintaining his innocence and expressing optimism about potential DNA evidence that could supposedly exonerate him. Gecht is quoted saying, First mistake is considering me a serial killer. I am not considered one. I have never killed or took part in any such acts nor ever been charged in any murders of anyone. I'm not an angel, but I never intentionally hurt anyone unless it was to protect myself or my family. I could never live with killing or knowing I was responsible for taking one's life. Jennifer Furio initiated a unique project involving correspondence with serial killers, and both Robin Gecht and Eric Spritzer responded. Their letters featured in her book, The Serial Killer Letters. Furio states that Spritzer falsely claimed to have turned himself in during the initial investigation. In the letter, Spritzer expressed supposed remorse for his role in the crimes, claiming he felt bad about the bloodshed and passing out at its sight. He attributed his actions to fear of Gecht and his shotgun, emphasizing that he never acted alone. Furio characterized him as weak, vulnerable, directionless, illiterate, and an easy target due to a troubled home life and substance abuse. According to Spritzer, Gecht offered him a job during a tough period, making empty promises and later blackmailing him with obscene photographs. Spritzer portrayed himself as sweet and gentle, seemingly incongruent with a murderer. He hoped for love and marriage before his then imminent execution. Spritzer maintained that the murders were not planned but random, with Gecht ordering him to stop the van whenever he saw a woman with appealing breasts. He believed the Cocorelli's brothers were also coerced into these actions. Despite little knowledge of them, he empathized more with them than the actual victims, asserting the executed Andrew was too young to die. In her interviews with Gecht, he delved into his purported obsession with breasts, attributing it to a familial trait. Well, in an answer to your question on the obsession with breasts, Gecht explains, it is a thing with my entire family going back, as I'm told, to great-grandfather. Each of us men has married large-breasted women. My ex-wife is a 39D, and yes, she was very satisfying to me. He then clarifies his stance on sex with breasts, stating, as to your question about having sex with breasts, I have no real obsession with breasts in that form. Only a very sick person would even think of that. His phrasing of this answer in particular makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. In examining this Manson-esque killer, who influenced others to commit harm, criminologist Eric W. Hickey's emphasized the shared pathology and symbiotic relationship in such cases, where power is experienced both by committing and witnessing murder. The collaboration adds to the excitement, enabling them to accomplish things within the dangerous dynamics of their association that they might not achieve alone. Drawing from Hickey's study involving over 300 serial killers, it was noted that 74% of team killers are white, with female participation occurring around one-third of the time. The majority of cases involved two offenders working together, and 15% of serial murder victims were attributed to team killers. Psychological control was a consistent element, with one individual maintaining dominance within the team. What are your thoughts on whether certain individuals possess such persuasive power over others? Alternatively, do you believe these individuals simply identify the latent desires of others and skillfully encourage them to act upon those inclinations? It's hard to imagine any normal person being able to be convinced to do some of the absolutely horrific things the Ripper crew did, even under threat, duress, or manipulation. Whatever the case, there is no doubt that Robin Gecht is a true monster in every sense of the word and doesn't deserve to see a day of his remaining life outside of prison. Gecht is due to be up for parole in 2042. If he survives that long, he will be over 90 years old. If you're still watching right now, thank you so much for sticking with me through this extremely long deep dive. This is a particularly dark and brutal case to explore, so I'm hoping it doesn't get taken down due to the disturbing subject matter being discussed. Let me know your thoughts about this horrific cult of killers down in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video, there are probably some other videos on screen right now you might enjoy watching next. And don't forget to like and subscribe to see more from my channel. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.